hello and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker. And uh, this is a special episode. I have uh, a guest, uh, Barry Schwartz, the Pro Shroud expert and official stirp photographer for the Shroud of Turin. And uh, I'm going to be uh, going to the interview I did with him. Just want to do a quick little introduction just to give you guys an uh, administrative note that there are some uh, there was a glitch that happened uh, in the middle of the, his presentation, so there, you'll see a bit of a glitch. The good news is Barry is a professional, and he knows what he's doing, so he quickly stopped, and when, he, when we started the recording back up again, he resumed right where he left off, so you guys don't really miss anything. So, uh, yeah, with that said, I, I basically just had to put the two, two parts together, um, and you can enjoy the video as is. So... Uh, yeah, with that said, let's uh, go over straight to the recording with uh, Barry Schwartz here. All right, hello and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker, and today I have a, a really special treat for you guys. Um, a special guest has come back. Believe it or not, he was the first special guest I ever interviewed on Skeptics and Seekers, uh, Barry Schwartz. Hey, Barry. Hey, Dale, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Welcome back. Um, Good to be back. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, today, Barry's going to be doing a special presentation for us, specifically looking at his area of expertise, the photography on the shroud. And uh, joining us, I have a couple of uh, co-hosts who are going to be asking Barry some questions, follow, following up on his presentation. So first place, we have Daniel Lowry. Hey, Daniel. How's it going, Dale? Awesome. Welcome back. This is your second time. Yeah, and thank you for having me. No, no problem. You're welcome. And we also have not a stranger to the show, Teddy Pappas. Hey, Teddy. Hello, everybody. How are y'all? Awesome. Awesome. All right, cool. So with that said, um, I don't want to beat around the bush. I want to give Barry uh, a chance to present his full presentation. Um, so yeah, it's over to you, Barry, for the next 45 minutes or so to tell us about the photography of the shroud. Okay, well, obviously, photography has played an important role in the world of the shroud. In fact, it was the first photograph that was made that sort of opened up the shroud for scientific study. So I, I have a presentation, it's called uh, Photography in the Shroud of Turin, what a coincidence. And uh, so with, with uh, that, I'm gonna try and share my screen and we'll see if that works. Host disabled participant screen sharing. <laughs> so that's, that's a lie. Uh... <laughs> Okay, so try it, try it again, try it now. All right, that's gonna work. Awesome. Hang in there with me. Don't go anywhere. And wait a minute, wrong, wrong one. No problem. There it is, that's the one I needed. Yep, got it. All right, there we go. So, uh, and this, I, I updated this just a few months ago, so it's, it's about as up to date as, uh, as I can make it. So let's begin, beginning with Secundo Pia in 1898, who made the first photograph. And here on the right, you can see the little camera that he used. Uh, what's interesting was that Secundo Pia had to deal with the fluctuating voltage in the Royal Palace. There was electricity there but the lights kept flickering and it caused him to underexpose his film. So he had to go back and do it a second time. Now, uh, there I am next to the camera. I used to laugh at this photo and say, oh, look at that old technology next to that new technology of that Nikon camera hanging around my neck. But today they're both equally obsolete because they both use film. Uh, I had a 10 year old kid at one of my uh, lectures to a younger group uh, put up his hand and ask me if film was a USB device. So that pretty much makes it difficult to explain to a younger audience one of the properties of the shroud, which is the left, right, light, dark reversal, like a photographic negative. So, uh, but you can see that uh, the difference in technology here over a hundred or so years, and poor Secunda Pia had to climb up on a scaffolding in front of the shroud, which is on display in the cathedral, he had to photograph it through glass, which of course in 1978, uh, when we were there, uh, we had nothing to obstruct us. There was no glass or anything. It was just us in the shroud. But he had to climb up on a 
scaffolding with that great big camera of his. He had to have big glass plates that he uh, used to photograph the shroud, but he was successful ultimately in making that very first photograph of the shroud. And this is his 1898 photograph. Not bad, but by today's standards and based on the photographs that have made since then, the quality here is rather poor by comparison, but it was still enough to get people excited and for people to reproduce this image into books and publications and begin to share it outside of Northern Italy. Uh, prior to 1898, not many people even knew about the shroud, again, outside of the Piedmont district of Northern Italy. And uh, the next photograph, and you know, poor Secundo Pia was immediately accused of fraud and uh, they chastised him and said that he manipulated things in the darkroom. And it wasn't until 1931, when Giuseppe Henrié, in this case, a professional photographer, will appreciate that, and really an amazing job considering the limitations of the technology he had to work with. By the time we got to Giuseppe Henrié, Kodak and other companies were manufacturing films, uh, so it, and and uh, not just on glass plates, but on acetate or uh, plastic backing, if you will. So films became much more popular by 1931, and the quality and resolution of the films had improved dramatically as well. Now, 1900s, <clears throat> several French researchers looked at the shroud image and with their own eyes determined they thought there was some depth information encoded into the image. The frustration was they had no way to verify this. But in the 1960s, a fine artist and sculptor named Leo Valla decided he got a brilliant idea. He projected a, a photograph of the shroud onto a block of clay, and he sculpted the three-dimensionality as he saw it with his own eyes and interpreted it with his artistic amazing. When you eat more easily, uh, he came very close to matching what was on the shroud. But again, this was just his interpretation. And so from a scientific point of view, uh, this wasn't verification that that property existed in the shroud. Then in 1976, John Jackson and Eric Jumper and Ken Stevenson and Don Devan went over, uh, they were all working on projects for the government at Los Alamos National Labs. They went over to Sandia Laboratories, which is a sister lab to Los Alamos, also a weapons lab. And there was a gentleman there named Bill Mottern, who was a, an ex-radiography expert. And he was using uh, x-rays for whatever his top secret classified information that he was doing at the lab, obviously something to do with weapons. And he had purchased this device, a VP8 image analyzer, to see if he could get more data from his, uh, his x-rays that he was producing. Uh, this has nothing to do with NASA. NASA had its own technology. They did not use a VP-8 for years because one reporter said, oh, the VP-8, they used it for mapping the moon and NASA used it. And that's been repeated constantly over the last couple of decades, but it's not correct. The VP-8 was at, uh, uh, at uh, the lab with uh, Bill Modern so that he could evaluate his x-rays. And this is the device that did it. Now, the significance of this device is that it was the first time that a scientific instrument was able to verify and visualize the, the characteristics or three-dimensional as it's called, uh, topographic or spatial data that's encoded into the density of the image of the shroud. And these video clips that are moving are taken right from the screen of a VP8. So uh, back in 1997, Kevin Moran, uh, I kept him up all night and we, shot onto videotape uh, things that he had put up on the VP8 screen from one of my photographs. And so you can clearly see the natural relief of a human form. And I want to be clear, <coughs> excuse me, anything you put, any image you put in the VP8, which is input via black and white video camera, is going to take whatever that's there and stretch it into vertical 3D space. It doesn't care what the image is. It takes the lights and darks and proportion it to each other, stretches them into space. The problem is uh, a normal image, when you do that, you get a jumbled shape of massive, you know, distorted, grossly distorted results, where with the shroud image, you, it yields the natural relief of a human form. 
Now, I always say that a normal photograph won't do that. So here's a normal photograph put in the VP8. These happen to be Kevin Moran's grandchildren. I just took the picture off his wall and we input it to the VP8. And if you'll notice, if you look at the kid at the bottom there, notice that his hair is going down into his head, that his nose and cheeks are flat, that his mouth is grossly distorted. And the little kid on the right, his whole face is just flat. So it'll take whatever the lights and darks are and put them into vertical space, but you don't get the natural relief of a human form with a normal photograph or artwork the way you do with the shroud. And that was the significance of the VP8. What it did was gave the guys who were looking at it the idea that maybe there's something about this image that's so important, we should put a team together and see if we can get permission to go and study the shroud and determine how this image was formed. So the VP8 effectively was the catalyst for the formation of the STIRP team. Now, if this property is truly in the image, there must be some other ways of detecting it and visualizing it. And Aldo Goreski, a, a professional photographer in Turin and a dear friend, a brother photographer, used a darkroom technique called photo relief or edge enhancement that we darkroom guys knew about. And he was able to extract that image and demonstrate that photographically that that information is actually there in the image. And what's interesting is this, that eight in VP8 stands for eight bit, which means it was working with a very limited grayscale. So going from black to white, there were only a, a, about eight steps in between and that was it. So the image on the VP8 is rather coarse. We're not restricted to an 8-bit grayscale with photographic film. And so you can see it's a much more refined and more detailed image uh, that Aldo Goreski was able to create, again, based on the data coming directly from the shroud. And of course, uh, now that uh, our team was being formed, we decided we would get together a month beforehand. We spent 17 months in planning, uh, designing experiments. You can see in this image, the table that was specifically designed to hold the shroud. It was made of steel so that we could fasten the shroud to the table with magnets so that we would not cause any harm to the cloth. It's interesting because when the shroud was on display in 78, they used thumbtacks to attach it to a piece of wood, leaving holes and little rust marks wherever the thumbtacks were. And consequently, uh, we decided we would use this table and rather than risking causing any harm to the shroud even the bar magnets that were used were coated with teflon which is inert and would leave no um, uh, metal particulates on the shroud so here you see they're just testing out the table at the dry run uh, we went ran through a lot of our experiments we had a uh, test plan which is available on shroud.com uh, I think I give, I've given Dale some links that you can go to shroud.com and find the papers that are relevant to the things I'm going to be talking about here today. Now, here you can see not only a, a replica of the shroud on our test table at the uh, dry run, you can also see in the foreground here, this is uh, the camera support system. The shroud being, you know, 14 and a half feet in length, and you want to make photographs of it, you want to keep your distance between camera and subject matter the same. So they designed a camera rail system. And here's where the camera would mount. And the camera can then slide along this rail. And what they would do is they set it up in front of the shroud. They measured the distance between the camera and the cloth. And they sandbagged the uh, rail support system into place so that when we slid the camera along that rail, um, the distance would remain the same. And 20 years after we, I made those photographs, I had them scanned and digitized. And when I put them together in Photoshop, because of this planning, those two images went together perfectly without a whole lot of uh, manipulation, only because they were smart enough to build this particular camera support system and make it uh, easy. And of course, none of us could anticipate where imaging was gonna go 20 years later, but because of their thoughtfulness and their thoroughness and preparation, uh, it made it a lot easier for me to create a single image file of the entire shroud based on the two halves that I photographed 
on this uh, camera support system, the resulting image is a 400 megabyte image from which we make our life-size replicas and prints. Now at the uh, dry run here, you can see Vern Miller, Don Devan, Don Lin, and Jean Lore. The two gentlemen standing were from the Jet Propulsion Lab, Vern Miller from Brooks Institute of Photography, Don Devan worked for Information Sciences in uh, Santa Barbara, California. He was the guy who called me up and said, um, and we had just finished working together on a seven month project for Los Alamos National Labs. And that had to do with atomic bombs. So I can't really talk much more about it because it was all classified, but he's the guy who called me up after we finished that uh, atomic bomb project and said, um, and I, you know, when you're self-employed and the phone rings, you're hoping it's another job. And so I'm thinking, aha, another project with uh, Los Alamos. And Don Devan said, well, not exactly. He said, um, what do you know about the Shroud of Turin? And I kind of laughed. I said, but Don, I'm Jewish. And, and Don laughed and said, so am I, remember? And Don was one of the other Jewish team members. So uh, he assured me that this was going to be about science and not about theology, which I'm not qualified to participate in. And, um, and so I, you know, he asked me, so we're going to put a team together. We're going to need a photographer. Are you interested? And I said, no. <laughs> but then I thought about it. And I thought about that property because he explained to me what they saw in the VP8. He said, Barry, there appears to be a correlation between image density and cloth to body distance. Well, I knew immediately that I couldn't create that kind of characteristic in a photographic image. Uh, it would be very difficult to do it artistically. And so it was that image property that sort of hooked me. And I was also thinking free trip to Italy. I'd never been to Europe. So I thought, well, sure, I'll go ahead and do this. So I went ahead and did it. Obviously, very grateful that I didn't listen to that little voice that said no and, and overrode that and, and decided to become a, a member of the team. So uh, here I am with one of the Hasselblad motorized cameras. Uh, we used the motorized Hasselblads because they had a large roll film back. And, and because a normal Hasselblad film back gives you 12 exposures. Well, we were planning to do thousands of exposures. So we went with the Hasselblad large format, two and a quarter inch, 70 millimeter film back where we could get 70 exposures on a roll of film, but we had to bulk load those cartridges in the dark room from Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so I'm just going to pick up right where we left off. Here we go. Here you can see I'm using that Hasselblad camera with a long roll film back. Uh, we used a 70 millimeter back on the Hasselblad. A normal Hasselblad uh, film load is 12 exposures. <clears throat> the 70 millimeter back allows for 70 exposures on a very long roll, which we had to bulk load from a, a, a big roll. But that enabled Vern Miller, who was using the Hasselblads for the scientific photography, to be able to um, accomplish a lot of exposures without having to continuously changing the roles of film. And here I am with the Hasselblad. Now, the back that's on that particular uh, view is a standard Hasselblad 12 exposure back. Now, we shipped all of our equipment over to Turin. Uh, about 80 crates of equipment, several tons of equipment, shipped it over to Turin. And uh, we were planning to get to Turin a week before the end of this public exhibition that uh, was the first one in 31 years. So uh, it was very important. And uh, when you look at this image, and I believe that it's there, uh, it doesn't look like there are that many people there, but if you look over here in this corner, and I'm hopeful that I have this image in here, I do. 
you can see there were a hundred thousand people standing in a queue just to get a two or three minute look at the Shroud of Turin. I was just blown away by that. I couldn't believe it. Now, the good news is that uh, since then, there's been this thing invented called the internet. And now, instead of having to line up at five o'clock in the morning, like, uh, like they do at Walmart for uh, Black Friday, uh, instead, you can go online, thanks to the internet, make an appointment for the date and time you intend to be there. They tell you not to come too early, just come you know, 15 or 20 minutes ahead of time. There are no longer these uh, 10 hour long queues to wait to get in. Now you might wait 30 to 40 minutes, perhaps on the weekend, maybe an hour, but nothing like what we had to experience back in 78. So uh, we get over to Turin, we ship all of our stuff over, we're there a week early. And the first news we get is that Italian customs saw a radiation sticker on the crate that the x-ray machine was in and consequently seized all of our equipment and refused to release it to us. So in the interim, they allowed us into the Royal Palace where we'd, where we'd be doing the examination, but of course all the equipment was still tied up in customs and they kept it, it took five and a half days. So that week we were there to get everything set up and calibrated and planned was cut short by five and a half days. And when they finally released the equipment to us, we were given, a, basically we had a day and a half left to get everything set up. So nobody went to sleep. In the meantime, here I am in the Royal Palace of Turin, being from Pittsburgh, PA, not too many Royal Palaces. I didn't have a lot of experience hanging out in Royal Palaces. So I thought, while well, I'm here, let me make some photographs. And so this is from the room in which we examine the shroud down the hallway, where we stored all of our equipment. And you can see down there, uh, two of the STIRP team members basically waiting around for the equipment to come out so that we, so we could get started and unpack everything and get it all set up. So while I'm there, I'm looking up and this is in the room in which we examine the shroud. This is the fresco in the ceiling. And I'm just blown away by this. So I thought, well, I'm here, I might as well make a photograph. And I thought this was a photograph that was for personal, for myself, and not for you know any scientific purposes. But after the fire of 1997, the rooms in which we examined the shroud had been damaged, not by the fire, but by water and smoke. And these frescoes were severely damaged. I was fortunate to be able to set, uh, to make a set of big prints of these frescoes and hand deliver them to the Archbishop of Turin so that he could that they could then use these in the restoration of these beautiful frescoes um and so from my point of view you know god works in mysterious ways here i'm thinking well these are just snapshots for barry but in the end they served a very important purpose in providing a record of those beautiful frescoes so they could be ultimately restored well eventually our equipment is released five and a half days later uh, it arrives on a big truck, a uh, dump truck, I might add, and we were fearful that the driver was going to just pull the lever and dump it all out. And he said, oh, no, no, you just, you have to unload the truck, though. G get it unloaded, please. So here we are unloading the equipment and moving it into the Royal Palace. This is an example of one of those rooms down that hallway I just showed you with some of our photo equipment. This is just one little small section of equipment. And this is uh, Vern Miller and in the back, uh, Ernie Brooks, both of them sadly passed away. Uh, Ernie Brooks was the owner of Brooks Institute of Photography started by his father. Uh, Vern Miller was the head of the in, uh, scientific and industrial division of the, un, of the Institute. And I was in the first class Vern Miller ever taught at the Institute, so he was one of my professors. And years later, when I got involved with the Shroud and they asked me to participate, once they explained to me all the different photography needs, I said, well, one guy working 24 hours a day couldn't do all that by himself. And they said, well, what do you suggest? And I said, let me call Vern Miller. So I called Vern and I said, hey, Vern, how'd you like a free trip to Italy on me? And he thought I was joking. And I said, no, I'm being serious. And Vern came on the team shortly thereafter. Ernie Brooks said, look, the Institute has these wonderful resources. Let's bring the resources of Brooks Institute onto the team. And then Vern Miller, who had a graduate student named Mark Evans, who was a master at the microscope, um, 
he brought Mark on to the team to do the microscopy part of the STIRP uh, tests. So here we are now getting things unpacked. And if you look real closely at the far end here, there I am peeking my head around the table. You can see the steel table. If you notice, there are panels, vertical panels in the table, because if you're going to do x-rays, you can't have a piece of steel there. So the panels were, the table was designed to have removable panels that could then be uh, removed during the x-ray process. So there'd be no metal interfering with the x-ray x-radiography. The other thing that happened was they didn't want to make the table stainless steel because apparently stainless steel is treated with certain chemicals that they were fearful might prove to be harmful. So it's just plain steel. The problem with plain steel is it's very susceptible to oxidation and corrosion. So these guys thought of that in advance. Remember, we had two guys from the Jet Propulsion Lab, NASA, and they brought with them some gold foil mylar that was used in the cargo bay of the space shuttle and on satellites, you've seen all that gold shiny stuff. That's gold foil mylar. And they brought some of that with them. And it's a good thing they did because we needed to cover each of those removable panels with the gold foil mylar, which is inert, so that we wouldn't get any of that white powdery uh, contamination onto the back of the shroud. We also were doing infrared or uh, yeah, infrared photography and thermography. And so we had to cover up the windows because the shutters had cracks and sunlight would beam through there and that would wreak havoc with those instruments. So we had to foil over all the windows in that room. And here you can see that rail system that I mentioned that I showed you a moment ago, Vern Miller, Sam Pellicori in the middle and Don Devan. And here they're now measuring the distance between the table and the camera plane, uh, the film plane, and they sandbag those, uh, that camera support system into place so that we could just slide the cameras back and forth along that rail and always maintain the same distance. All of this had to be thought of in advance and fabricated from scratch before we ever left for Turin. And, and I point all these things out to show you the level of preparation that the STIRP team went through to develop the experiments that they intended to do. This wasn't some last minute, oh, quick, let's go look at the shroud. This was thorough intent. And look, these were scientists from Los Alamos and Sandia Labs and the Air Force Weapons Lab, which is Lockheed uh, and of course JPL. These are hardcore scientists. People say, oh, they're a bunch of religious fanatics. Far from it, <laughs> far from it. And uh, there were three of us Jewish guys on the team. So obviously we didn't have that emotional connection to the uh, theological aspects of the shroud ourselves. Anyway, they bring us the shroud about an hour and a half early. And, uh, you know, I always point out since this is a photography uh, presentation, if you were to look real closely at this, you'll see that the only thing sharply in focus in this photograph is the wall back here at the back because this was one of those cases where somebody yelled, here comes the shroud. So I had to grab the camera, put a lens on it, put the flash on it, turn on the flash, run out into the hallway, and I got wham, one shot. And it wasn't properly focused, but this event will never be repeated again. So even a somewhat out of focus photograph is better than none at all. But I always kind of laugh at this because I can look at it closely and I can see that way in the background, that back wall there, perfectly sharp, but the guys in the foreground carrying the shroud and they're bringing it out the back door of the Guarini Chapel into the Royal Palace. The chapel, the cathedral, the palace are all connected to each other. You can go from one to the next to the next without ever having to go outside. So now here we are, they've now removed the shroud from that wooden board. You can see the white painted board on the left there. They had to remove all the thumbtacks and clean up all the little rust stains around each hole. And here the shroud is now being moved onto our table and ultimately onto uh, the table with the white magnets. Those are those white bars around the edges. Those are the magnets coated in Teflon that were used to hold the shroud in place. And it's a good thing that we had that uh, gold foil mylar because every one of those uh, panels had to be covered with that mylar so we could put the shroud on it the way we did. Now, uh, this is probably the, maybe the most well-known photograph I made of, uh, of the event itself in 1978. I guess it's, it's successful because 
of the intensity of the expressions on the three men that are prominent in the image. Um, and on the right there is Professor Giovanni Rigi. On the left, Ray Rogers, and behind him looking over them is uh, John Jackson. Uh, Professor Rigi was given the go ahead to go before uh, the STIRP team started their examination. And one of the plans that Rigi had come up with, by the way, he'd been given two weeks notice, no budget, no time, and he had to come up with something. So what he decided he would do was to separate the shroud from the backing sheet, the Holland cloth, it was called, that was sewn onto the back of the shroud in 1534 by the poor Claire sisters to repair the fire damage that caused all the burns and scorches on the cloth. So he got the idea to separate that in, in a few areas and insert both a vacuum to vacuum any uh, loose debris that might be in there and an endoscopic camera system that he could use to view the backside of the shroud, which nobody had seen in 450 years. As a matter of fact, that's the real significance of this image. They unstitched the backing cloth for the first time 450 years. This moment is the precise moment where modern science got the first look at the backside of the shroud in 450 years. Nobody had ever seen the backside before that. Nobody alive, at least. So that's the significance. Now here you can see he's inserting something between the shroud and the hauling cloth. Now, people have asked me on more than one occasion, why didn't Sturp also have an endoscopic camera system for looking at the reverse side? Well, the answer is because endoscopic camera systems and fiber optic bundles in 1978 were not very good. As a matter of fact, we tested one of those systems at the dry run. And uh, that's John Lohr. And we, they brought an endoscopic camera system to the dry run. They tried to use it to photograph a, a, a test sheet piece of fabric. You can see that on the left. And I made a photo of John Lohr through that fiber optic endoscope just to show you um, how difficult it would be. Now, people have asked me that question. And I always point out, Rigi never released any of his endoscopic images. Why? He didn't release them because they were useless. And if you look closely, you can see here all these little black spots. A fiber optic bundle are long, thin glass wires, if you will, bundled together into a solid bundle so that you can pass light through them and an image through them. If one of those little glass bundles breaks, you get a little black spot, the way you see on the left. And if you look even closer, you can see there's the pattern of the fiber optic bundle, which overlap that on the shroud weave and you're, you're lost. You'll, you'll be making uh, errors in, in judgment of what you think you might be seeing because this is another pattern overlaying an already complex pattern of weave on the shroud. So this is the newest stuff. I just went back a couple months ago and wanted to pull this out because it keeps coming up in some of my lectures. So this is why Sturp did not go with a fiber optic delivery bundle system. Now, Rigi did have his though, and thank goodness he did, because one of the things Rigi uh, determined was his fiber optic system could see a circular image area 10 centimeters in diameter. Well, how do you know what you're looking at from the underside? So he designed a grid of string with 10 centimeter squares that he could lay on the shroud, causing it no harm. And then when he turned on his focusing lamp underneath, he could precisely align it with what was on the top side. Very simple, very brilliant idea. But more significant than that is when he turned on that focusing light, I immediately called for the room lights to be turned off so I could make this image because with light transmitted through the shroud, this is the forehead blood stain you can clearly see there's added density where the blood soaked into the cloth. Now, if this cloth, if the image on this cloth were a painting, well, then if we photographed the entire shroud with transmitted light and it were painted, we would see density wherever the paint was added. So they added to my list of tasks during the event for me to photograph the entire shroud with transmitted light. The significance of these photographs is if you look closely, you can see blood stains at the arms, the wrist, the spear wound, at the feet, 
You can see water stains from the stains from the 1532 fire. You can see all the scorches. You can see the burns. You can see the holes. You can see where the patches didn't completely cover the holes, but you don't see the image. And this is the first piece of scientific data that I can show you that indicates right from this photograph alone, nothing was added to create that image on the cloth or we would have seen it here. No paint, no pigment, no artistic medium was used. And here's the proof. There's the image of the shroud and I've tried to superimpose these two. You can see there's no image of the shroud visible with transmitted light. Although you do see running through the entire length of the shroud, all those bands from the different batches of yarn that were used to weave the cloth. Back in the ancient times, cloth was woven from small batches of yarn. Each batch bleached out in the sun. So they're all a little different from each other. And we have determined that how those bands work determined how well the image was taken up in that particular band. Some bands took up the image less than adjacent bands. No real in-depth studies ever been made of that. So that's still something for the future that hopefully future researchers can pay more attention to and try and determine why some bands took up the image darker than the adjacent band, which the image was more faint on. So continuing on. Now, these are some of the experiments that were imaging experiments, uh, not just photography, but I'm showing you the instruments and I've put the names of the uh, experiments on the screen just to simplify it and not to put anybody to sleep by saying infrared reflectance spectroscopy too many times. So you can see here uh, in the background, John Jackson with a microscope looking at the shroud with the instruments set up, the thermal instruments set up in front of it. And there's the little devil that cost us five and a half days in customs. Now, you know, when you have uh, when you go to the dentist and he puts that little x-ray plate in your jaw and he goes click click it takes about one second to expose the x-ray this is a very low power x-ray because x-rays could be harmful to the cloth especially high dosage of high power x-rays so this is a very low power you can see it's much smaller than the x-ray machines that we're all used to seeing because it's a low power x-ray the problem with a low power x-ray is the exposure times are extremely long, 20 minutes to be precise. So uh, the gentleman on the right, uh, Bill Mottern and Ron London on the left, when they were making the actual x-ray exposures, they had to get all of us out of the room and they had to only shoot in the middle of the night. Remember, we're in a 400 year old palace. And in those days, traffic was routed right next to the building. So every time a bus or a truck went by, a big vehicle went by, the whole building would vibrate, and that would have blurred the long exposure x-rays. So they had to do all the x-rays in the middle of the night. Uh, and all of us had to leave the room. And once he started the exposure, Bill Modern, who was making the exposure, could not move his feet for 20 minutes because just moving around on those par old parquet wooden floors would have caused vibrations to blur the x-ray. They managed to do, I think, 46 x-rays under those circumstances. And here you can actually see them looking at one. Now, one of the problems with x-rays is, okay, we went over there and everything's in lead foil and lead foil bags to protect the x-ray film. But coming back, we have to come through airports with x-ray machines all over the place. So we realized that we could not risk damaging the exposed x-rays by trying to bring them back to process them here in the US. So they had to bring with them x-ray processing equipment and process the x-rays on site. Well, when you're doing x-rays, and, and this, this is what you have to do. There was only one room in that part of the Royal Palace that had the two requirements uh, for processing x-rays, a room that could be made totally dark and a water supply. And this was the only water supply in that half of the palace that was the only working bathroom. So every time somebody needed to process film or x-rays, they would come in the room and just like we did with the kids before taking them on a long trip, anybody need to go to the bathroom, you better go now. It's going to be a dark room for the next hour and a half. So you can see that it, although not ideal, we had to be flexible and we had to deal with what was provided to us. And so this, <laughs> I always laugh at this photograph, but this is what we had to do. But fortunately, we were able to make those x-rays and bring them back. And of course, they're now readily available. Uh, in the papers that were published by the X-radiography guys. 
We also did photomicroscopy, photographs through a microscope. And that beautiful instrument uh, was loaned to the STERP team by the manufacturer, Wild, W-I-L-D-E. And this is Mark Evans making some of the photomicrographs through that optical system. Uh, again, remember the vibration issue? The higher your magnification, even in a microscope, especially one that's on an arm that can vibrate, um, the higher the magnification, the more vibrations will amplify and blur the image. So we could not go to the highest magnifications under this setup because the vibrations would have blurred the images. But he was able to make some pretty spectacular photomicrographs. And this is one of the blood stains. You can see the reddish color of the blood still there. And this is one of the images. And uh, tip of the nose, if I recall correctly. And if you look closely here, you'll see if I can get my, um, there you go. See this yellowed area here? And there's a little yellow here and a little yellow here. And of course, depth of field or focus is very limited to a very narrow plane when you're at high magnification. But that is what's on the shroud. No particulates, nothing that would cause the image to be based on a uh, painting or artwork, just yellow discolored fibers, more yellow than the surrounding fibers. And much like a halftone reproduction in a magazine, which is made of little dots, if you look with a magnifier at, at a photographic print or printed into a magazine, you'll see it's made of little dots. The darker areas have a higher concentration of dots closer together. The lighter, more faint areas of an image uh, reproduced that way have fewer of those dots in the area. And the same is true of these yellowed fibers on the shroud. So often you'll hear it's compared to a half tone, uh, but basically it's because the image, the color of the uh, shroud is the same. The yellow discoloration is the same throughout. What makes the image appear darker or lighter is the concentration of those images in any given spot. Now also Vern did the ultraviolet fluorescence photography. This is uh, him doing some other uh, testing here at the, uh, with some of the light system, lighting systems. And the UV fluorescence photography, you can see because a lot of the work that Vern did uh, on that Hasselblad camera was photographing the shroud in one area up close through three different RGB filters uh, onto black and white film. Those can later then be combined to create a full color image. So you can see that they designed a special filter wheel so that rather than having to screw on and unscrew a filter the way you would normally do with a single camera, they could just rotate that filter wheel to change filters, saving a, a, an ordinary amount of time. Again, this was all thought of in advance and designed and fabricated specifically for the examination of the shroud. And this is one of Vern's UV fluorescence photographs of the spear wound blood stain. And what's interesting, if you look closely, you'll see a faint halo around that blood stain here. It's only visible with ultraviolet fluorescence photography. So this amazing medieval forger who made a painting with no paint, um, also was able to hide the serum stains, which are only visible with UV fluorescence, hoping that, you know, 700 years from now, maybe somebody will figure a way to see this. Well, that's nonsense. So obviously these are serum stains and that adds to the legitimacy of these blood stains. And so again, photography plays an important role here in visualizing something that otherwise was, would not be visible to the unaided eye. Now, one of the other theories proposed by uh, a well-known skeptic whose name I'll not mention uh, was that somebody took a metal statue, a beautiful sculpture of Jesus, heated it up and scorched the image onto the shroud. Now, there's a viability to that proposed idea because the scorches on the shroud, which were from that 1532 fire, pretty much the lighter part of the scorches are about the same density and color as the image itself. So this was a viable proposal. And so we used ultraviolet fluorescence photography uh, to examine the shroud. And what we saw, and I'm sorry, I have very few of these have words on the screen, but you can see there's a slight red fluorescence surrounding all the scorched areas. <coughs> the scorched areas 
were impacted by a high temperature event, obviously the fire. The image, not only did it not fluoresce, but it quenched the fluorescence of the background. The background has sort of a yellow green fluorescence uh, and the image does not fluoresce in any direction, obviously not the product of high temperature, but it also blocked some of the background fluorescence of the sheet itself. So this eliminates high temperature event for the cause of the image on the shroud. This is the data that supports that conclusion. And there I am uh, with uh, my four by five camera, as you can see on the camera support system at the bottom there. And there you can clearly see uh, the shroud and that's right behind that vertical stanchion is Vern Miller. I had handed my Nikon to Mark Evans to get a shot of me doing this. I think this is one of the few photographs of me at the event because I was behind the camera the whole time. But uh, there I am making one of the four by five inch photographs. I photographed half the shroud at a time. And of course, these are the results that uh, are familiar to everybody now from that event. And this, of course, is, uh, like I said, 20 years afterwards, I went and I, I was in Los Angeles at the time. I went to the finest custom uh, digital photo lab in Los Angeles, which is a very good one. And they scanned on a Crossfield drum scanner, my four by five film. And uh, I was able to put them into Photoshop and put together the two halves, and you can see how clearly, how neatly they went together without a whole lot of necessary uh, retouching and manipulation. Again, because of that camera support rail system that made it possible 20 years later for me to come compact these. And of course, this is the resultant black and white image from that, from that photograph. Now, I was also responsible photographically for documenting where each researcher took his data from. Well, since we were already using bar magnets to hold the shroud onto the table, got the idea to use smaller magnets, also, by the way, coated in Teflon, uh, as place markers. So when a researcher took data from a specific point, he would put one of these magnets in that spot. And when he finished in that area, I would come in and photograph that spot with those magnets in place. And after we returned from Turin, I spent about two months reconstructing maps of all those data test points, which were then published in an IEEE paper, which is readily available on shroud.com. And Dale's going to put a bunch of links on his uh, blog page and on his YouTube page, uh, which uh, I have suggested that includes a link to this paper so you can see the, in more detail. But listen, the frustration I have from today's perspective it took me two months to create eight maps. Today, I could probably do it in two or three days in Photoshop. So the technology differences, because all this was done in the dark room with pin registration, I won't go into detail, but it just shows how important the photography was, even at this level, just to document exactly where these researchers took their data from. So you can find this, as I said, on trial.com. Now, as uh, many people already know, <clears throat> we came back from Turin and spent uh, the next three years reducing the data, studying it, analyzing it, drawing conclusions, and then writing up the results based on the raw data into papers that were then submitted to the finest peer-reviewed journals of the day. And even to this day, getting your work into applied optics, if you're a researcher, any researcher that might be watching this, knows how difficult that can be. And yet that's where stir papers are. And so this is the conclusion that in the end, although we went there to determine how the image was formed, we really couldn't answer that single question. What we could do is tell you what it's not. It's not a painting, it's not a scorch, it's not a photograph or a rubbing. Those were the proposed suggestions by skeptics and our data shows none of those are true. The only correct answer to what formed the image on the Shroud of Turin, we don't know. And anybody who makes claims that, oh yes, it was this or that or the other, not from a scientific point of view. Now, in all fairness, 
Many of the people who visit our website and who I correspond with are people of faith that really don't care much about the science at all. They don't care what the science says. Their belief is that it was the resurrection event that created the image on the shroud. And there's no way that anybody could argue with that. That's certainly possible, but that's something science can't deal with because the scientific method restricts you to working within that method. And it says you cannot use an unknown, the mechanism of resurrection, to prove another unknown, the mechanism of image formation on the shroud. So I always tell people, look, that's a test of faith, not science. And if your faith tells you that the resurrection did this, I, I wouldn't argue the point. It's just that from a scientific point of view, we can't say that. So I always like to say that and make it clear that we, I have total respect for those who look at this as an object of faith and who believe this was caused by the resurrection. And since we don't know what the resurrection event was or the mechanism was, we can't exclude that as a possibility even scientifically. So from my point of view, I'm happy with people. But I also tell people this, that if your faith requires science to support it, and the problem isn't the science. The problem is your faith. You need to go back and re-examine your faith because the whole concept of faith is to accept and believe without having to have a bunch of physical evidence. But I also believe that the shroud is physical evidence of Jesus of Nazareth, the historic Jesus. That's not a theological point of view. That's more from a historical point of view. And I am firmly convinced that this is the authentic burial shroud of Jesus. Awesome. Thank and you thank much. you very much. And I think I can escape out of that. And uh, yeah, just close this. Stop sharing. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Well, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you so much for that presentation. Excellent presentation there, Barry. Sorry. Sorry to the audience for the little glitch there. I'll, I'll put it together in editing. Yeah, you'll, you can fix it in post. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, awesome. All right. Well, Right away, uh, just in case this uh, stupid Zoom account, uh, it's through my university, so they might have changed it. Uh, I don't want to lose Daniel Lowry, so I want to turn it straight to Daniel. You get a chance to ask your questions first, just in case we get cut I'm, off at the hour mark. I'm just curious, Dale, how long was that? How long did I take? Um, so I don't, I... Hard to say. I, I, probably I'm, around... I'm, 40, 45 minutes. So. Okay, all right. So it was Very in the little... ballpark of what I thought. Okay, yeah. all right, go for it, Daniel. Yeah. Thank you so much for that awesome presentation, Barry. Um, I wanted to sort of ask a couple questions about the prep stage uh, that you and the team went through, because that's something that I don't really see discussed a lot on like popular forums and stuff yeah, like kinda, that. So I- kind of boring. <laughs> yeah, because one of the, one of the sort of uh, accusations that sometimes gets thrown around is that, well, the scientists were doing their best, but they didn't, there might have, not taken into account X, Y, or Z, or something like that, or some, something might have come up in, during the process that uh, uh, prejudices their sort of findings and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, from your testing, uh, spending that time before going over to turn, what were some of the challenges that you discovered in the testing phase that you had to sort of adjust? Well, I think there were virtually challenges every day. I mean, it, it's, uh, I think John Heller writes about that somewhat in his book, uh, about our team, um, we, we had to overcome just some just amazing difficulties at every single step of the way. But I want to address this business of uh, bias on the part of these team members. Look, these are hardcore, the majority of them were hardcore scientists working in the weapons industry. Uh, they were the most meticulous empirical men I have ever dealt with. And I've worked in the sciences 15 years as a consultant at Cedar sinai Medical Center, nobody ever came as close to being in the most empirical I've ever seen. And Ray Rogers being a, a shining example, he used to see something I would put on the website where I said something was proven. And he would call me up and yell at me. We don't have enough data to say it's proven. You can say the, the evidence is pointing in that direction, but it's not proven. Change it. Okay, Ray. And I changed it. So when it came to empiricism, these guys were hardcore and be thankful to God that these guys were that kind of meticulous because think of what they were involved with on their day-to-day -day jobs, that if they made some stupid mistakes, millions of people could die. So, so I think that 
for, for people accusing him of being either sloppy or biased by their faith, look, Ray Rogers was the most empirical scientist I've ever worked with. And when I interviewed him about eight months before he died, he had kept that side of himself so hidden. I had to ask him if he was an atheist. And of course, he, he said, no, I'm not an atheist. He went to church every Sunday until his prostate cancer got to be so painful he couldn't get in the car. Um, but I had to ask him because he made no, there was never a sign of his faith. Now, on the other hand, there were other members of the team like John Jackson, who was a cradle Catholic, raised in the Catholic faith, very devout. Uh, his mother gave him a photograph of the Shroud of Turin when he was 12 years old, which is a pretty good uh, understanding of how he became involved as the co-founder of the Sturp team. This has been something that was within John for decades before. Um, and so when people say, oh, well, they are a bunch of biased religious fanatics, what about the three Jewish guys on the team? We weren't a bunch of Christian religious fanatics. We didn't have any Christian biases. And, you know, it's <clears throat> kind of ironic today. Many of the main skeptics don't want to debate me anymore because I disarm them and take away their biggest piece of ammunition. Oh, well, they're a bunch of religious, Christian religious fanatics. They don't want to emphasize, they don't want to uh, have a debate with me. Why? Because they can't accuse me of a Christian bias because I never had one. <laughs> okay. So to me, um, look, if I take an instrument and I point that instrument at a piece of cloth and I pull that trigger to take a reading with that instrument, that instrument doesn't care if I'm a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, or a pagan. It doesn't matter. And because STERP made available their raw data, if you disagree with their conclusions, go back and repeat an experiment, go back and evaluate it. It's all in the peer reviewed literature. That's how science works. And so the way I see it, anybody who makes that accusation is ignoring all the real science because they can't really contend with that. And they're looking for any excuse to attack the pro shroud folks, but we don't care. <laughs> yeah. they're never going to go away you know they're always going to be there and so you, if you're going to be involved with the shroud especially publicly get used to the fact there will always be skeptics they will always be accusatory they will always try and give you a bad time and my advice is ignore them that's the thing they hate the most if you give them attention they love it so if you ignore them that drives them crazy so that's my way of getting even i just ignore them you know, one of the things, uh, Barry, is that uh, that's worth mentioning is that Alan Adler, Dr. Alan Adler, he was uh, along with uh, Dr. Heller, but uh, I mean, they were, I mean, I know, I know Ray Rogers was a chemist too, but it seemed like the, the lion's share of the blood work, especially, and, and also with the body image was done by them. And yeah, because Adler was a blood chemist. That was mm -hmm. his specialty. It's Rogers was a, yeah, Rogers was a porphyrins, right. Rogers was an organic chemist. Mm -hmm. So there was an overlap. And if you've seen uh, John Marino's most, one of his more recent papers, we were kind of joking around about how many different disciplines were involved. And I guessed about 30. He's up to 97 different wow. disciplines that have been involved in the study of the Shroud of Turin. So when people say, well, it should be a simple yes or no. Is it real or not? I go, well, I wish it were that simple, but it's taken 97 disciplines to study it. And we still don't have the final answer. But I just love that, you know, Alan Adler uh, is a Jew. Yep. And, and he remained a Jew to his, to, till his death. He did not have a dog in the fight. And That's right. he's probably, um, I don't know, I think one of the biggest advocates of its Interestingly often. enough, in a conversation I had with Al Adler, the one where he sort of explained the Billy Rubin theor theory okay. to me, um, he said that he started that conversation. He said, you know, Bear, that's what he called me. He said, you know, Bear, he says, I pretty much come to the conclusion this got to be the real thing. This is from another Jewish guy, like you pointed out. And he remained Jewish and I remain Jewish. I'm not a Messianic Jew, much to the chagrin of my Catholic and evangelical <laughs> friends. And, and that's fine. Listen, I get evangelized virtually daily. Uh, at the very beginning of it all, it was a little bit off-putting. And, and then I realized, look, 
This is somebody who wants me to feel in my heart what they obviously feel in theirs. That's an expression of love. So I'm never offended when somebody evangelizes me. It does get a little tiresome sometimes, but I'm not offended by it. I understand why it's done and I appreciate it. But look, I was on that team, not in spite of being a Jew, but because of it. And I've said this in my public lectures, I'll say it here. What's a nice Jewish boy like me doing involved the most important relic of Christianity? And the answer, usually an hour later at the end of my talk is, oh yeah, the answer to that is, isn't it funny how God always seems to pick a Jew to be the messenger? I'm just the messenger. You know, uh, that is, you know, <laughs> that's the way I see it. That's my role in all this. And, and I don't need to change my beliefs. If anything, it adds credibility and it shuts up some of the skeptics because they can't accuse me of having the bias that perhaps some others might have. Do you know, I, I've heard um, there is at least one atheist and an agnostic on the team. Is, is at least. that true? Yeah. Do, do you know oh. who those were? Or? No, because it, it, see, that's, I've been criticized for not publishing on our website, on the list of team members, their religious affiliations. Well, first of all, I would have to know their religious affiliations. And with the exception of the three Jewish guys, and I, Vern Miller and I were friends. I know he was Mormon. Ken Stevenson is a, an overt evangelical. So that was obvious. As far as the rest, who knows? It was never a criteria for membership. And if it had been, you wouldn't have seen that team in its configuration that we had. A lot of those guys would have disengaged. This was not about religion. That was what kept me from saying yes when they first asked me. I didn't want to get involved in a religious thing. And they assured me, no, this is about science. And the 20 or so peer-reviewed papers that came out of our initial uh, examination, that's where the real evidence lies. So I'm very proud to have been a part of that team, but I don't think that there was any religious bias in the data or even in the conclusions because the conclusions are based on the data. Now, as far as personal beliefs, yeah, I'm sure that there were some people in that room that were experiencing a much more spiritual uh, moment than some of the rest of us uh, because they were in, you know, in contact with this important piece of cloth from, the, uh, from a Christian point of view. So, but like I said, what they felt they kept within themselves. They didn't go around going, oh my God, look, it's Jesus. Nobody did that. We were so intent on accomplishing what our very uh, uh, in-depth test plan required. We didn't have time to sit around and contemplate. We were too busy. Afterwards or in the quiet of the night when things slowed down a little bit, sure, I'm sure that some of the guys had some emotional response to being there. But again, that was all, always set aside because we had so much to accomplish in such a short period of time. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. Dan Daniel, did you have uh, other questions? Yeah. Um, I was just curious because um, one thing that sort of comes up uh, a lot of times in more modern studies is some of the difficulties of not being able to examine materials directly. Um, there hasn't been a second stirp. There hasn't been a lot of other physical right. sort of studies on the clock. That's right. Um, so one thing I see in a lot of papers is that there's a lot of references to some of your work that you did on that first investigation. So I'm curious, um, like, can you just sort of describe like how uh, it is, uh, you know, 40 years down the line, your work is still impacting a large portion of the material that gets published on this? Well, in, in science or in academia, they refer to certain works as primary sources. In the case of the Shroud, a primary source is something based on direct physical examination of the cloth itself. And we, of course, did a very extensive, albeit five days, not a lot of time, working literally around the clock to accumulate that. But, you know, we would all like to see another go round of tests. It's 44 years later. Uh, the technology has advanced dramatically. Some technology exists today that didn't even exist back in 1978. And so we felt, uh, you know, I, I think we all feel that we would like to see additional testing performed, but again, done the same way that Sterp did theirs with long-term planning, uh, collecting people, and, and people don't understand how the Sterp team formed. Um, 
you, I explained how they got, got a hold of me. I had done a seven month consulting project for Los Alamos National Labs, a photographic consultant. Um, and because Don Devan was involved in that VPA test, that very first test, uh, it was uh, Don who called me because he said, hey, I know this photographer and I know he's technically competent because we just did this project. Let me call up Schwartz and see what he has to say. And that's how I got a hold of Vern Miller because I knew he had more experience with UV fluorescence and things of that. I knew about them. I'd studied them. I'd done them uh, as a student, but that's, you don't go as a student and test the shroud. So I brought Vern Miller on and somebody at, uh, uh, said, uh, you know, we, we need an organic chemist. And somebody said, hey, I know this guy at Los Alamos, Ray Rogers. And they went and got Ray Rogers who did have some archeological experience as well uh, in studying uh, Native American artifacts in the Southwest. He was from New Mexico. So uh, each of the team members was selected, not because they all went to church together. They were selected because they were an expert in technology that were part of the types of testing that were outlined to be done on the shroud. We need a blood expert. Al Adler and Heller came along. Uh, we need a, an x-ray guy uh, from uh, not Los Alamos, but from uh, the other lab. Uh, it, basically, we brought people on board based on the design of the experiments we were to perform. And so we brought on the finest quality guys we could. But in all fairness, since this has come up, in hindsight, you know, you can look back and say, gee, we should have, we could have, we would have, and we didn't. One of the biggest errors we made, remember, we brought in experts in all these different categories. And these were a bunch of guys in the weapons industry, so the media was the enemy always, from their point of view. What we needed was a professional media consultant, uh, spokesperson, agent, whatever you want to call them, somebody that knew how to deal with the media that could take and throw the dog a bone every day. We, in turn, were forbidden to speak to the press. Well, if you're a reporter and I say, I'm sorry, I'm forbidden to speak to you, now you're going to wonder why. Well, what, why? And they're going to chase you down the street asking questions. And that's exactly what happened. What we needed was somebody who could draft a daily little press release saying, oh, the testing is going as planned. We've done this experiment and that experiment. Just throw the dog a bone. We didn't do that. And no offense to my dear friend, Ken Stevenson, they gave Ken the role of being the spokesman for the team, but being an evangelical Christian, he couldn't really separate that from himself. And I understand that. And so he didn't do us any good. And he and I've had this conversation face to face. So I'm not speaking behind his back. He and I are still dear friends. And he admits that, yeah, he, he couldn't help himself. And I understand that he's a human being and he's deep in his faith. And so that was reflected, but it's not a good thing when you're representing a scientific team to start talking about your faith and, and promoting it in that respect. So, so in hindsight, yeah. The other thing I think we could have done, we had a textile expert from the LA Museum, but he wasn't in Turin with us. And in retrospect, looking back today, I think everybody would agree he should have come along with us. So was it perfect? No but it sure is better than the alternative, which was nothing at all. Could you have something, so, oh, uh, Barry, in yeah. terms of with Ken, uh, I would say that, I mean, I, I get what you're meaning in terms of optimum, uh, in terms of total lack of bias, but there's always going to be a bias. If it was an atheist, well, then their bias is leaning the other way. No, but and the, the truth is, something that's independent of bias. So one can be, you know, 100% biased about a certain thing, but if you've got, the, the beauty of science is if you've got that evidence and it's reproducible, it doesn't matter what your bias is. Well, yeah, I, I understand all that, Teddy. I, I just think that when Ken got up on Good Morning America and said, I believe this is an image of my Lord Jesus, that didn't help the scientific aspects of our team. And Ken agreed to that because, we were at the Los Alamos meeting in 19, what was that, 79. And uh, we had a, uh, we went to Ron London's place and they roasted a goat in the ground Native American style, which is kind of cool. Wow. And Ken Stevenson showed up and everybody was upset with Ken for what he had just said on television the day before. And he came up 
to me and I said, you know, Ken, I got a bone to pick with you. And I told him what I thought about what he had said. And he said, well, thank you for saying it to my face. Because nobody else had the guts to go right up to Ken and go, gee, Ken, I wish you hadn't done that. That didn't really help much. Did you know what? That, Did that way, Ken admittedly that it was a mistake. And he said, and I, I put my arm, and he and I are still brothers today, friends. Uh, why? Because we were honest with each other. Uh, he couldn't help himself, and I said this didn't help us. So in, whatever you want to say, Teddy, it was a mistake that Sturt made in not bringing in an uninterested third-party expert that knows how to deal with the press, let them deal with the press so we could do our science. Yeah, right. the, the one Teddy, thing that... Okay, to, yeah, I'll let, I'll let you finish off a statement kind of thing, but um, I just want to make sure, Daniel, are, are you are you good or are you? Have you I'm still good. I'm still good. So okay, cool. Um, all right, cool. So before just before we get to Teddy, I just have two quick questions on my end, if that's okay. For and this this comes from kind of audience members and stuff. So one of them um, is about body image superficiality. Um, do you think the, some people say there's three levels of superficiality that start proved, you know, it's on the fabric level, uh, on the thread level, it's only the top two to three fibrils. And then even at the fibril level, it's only on the primary cell level. And some, some skeptics have denied that and said, no, there's, there's no proof for that or that kind of superficiality. So as you, as a photographic expert, you know, what is the evidence for the superficiality there? Well, I, I think that it's pretty much apparent. And, and, and in one of my photographs uh, in the presentation, you could see Jackson back there with a microscope on the shroud. Even though we didn't photograph every square inch of the shroud through the microscope, obviously that would have taken a week in its own. Um, Rogers, Jackson, and several of the other guys, whenever there was a free moment or a free space, remember the shroud is big. And if you're working over here, something else can be going on over here. Um, they, they were studying this thing in depth. And I believe that the level of superficiality has been, that has been uh, detailed in the published papers, I think that's credible. And look, the skeptics will find fault with everything. I mean, and with anything. Um, show me some peer-reviewed evidence challenging the, rate of the uh, shroud, other than the radiocarbon dating paper, which it's a whole separate subject we won't go into, but we already know there are five or six papers challenging that. And once they released that raw data after 27 years of saying no, once the raw data got released, thanks to Tristan Casabianca using the Freedom of Information Act in England to get the British Museum to release all that stuff, then we were able to see some other things that we didn't know. And then we began to understand why they didn't want to release their raw data. Because you know, when you're taking readings and you're doing uh, these age dating tests, there's something called outliers that kind of are way off the chart in a different direction. So they throw away the outliers. Well, the problem is when you look at how many outliers they threw away, had they kept any of those outliers, they couldn't have reached 95% certainty that they claimed. So there's a question mark about, oh, well, wait a minute. Did you selectively pick those that fit your mold and exclude those that would point in a different direction? I'm not saying that's the case. I'm not a physicist, I'm not qualified, but the experts who have studied that raw data have also shown that that strip that was cut had one date at one end and a dramatic date at the other end, and it was a continuous change of dates through that strip. So how can you pick any spot on that sample and tell me that it relates to anywhere else on that cloth? You can't, not scientifically. So all I'm saying is we now know that the radiocarbon dating was flawed, the sample, because they only took one, there were no control samples. Who ever heard of a, 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 an examination of something that important without even one control sample taken anywhere else on the cloth from a corner, from an edge? Nothing. Just that one sample cut in half, then the other one half cut in thirds, and that's what they carbon dated. Going and, against Sterp's recommendation. Well, Sterp was kicked out of the mix, but that was politics. Mm -hmm. That was church politics so awesome and awesome. i'm not qualified to discuss that 
no no problem <laughs> Um, all right, cool. Well, uh, so a couple, just a couple more questions. So another thing that is a good question for you from my audience um, is what brought you on board? You talked about the quote unquote three dimensionality of the shroud, the depth information encoded. And one of the things that you personally have said is look, look, look from that right away, you knew it couldn't be a photograph or some kind of artistic thing. Um, now, some skeptics question that and they say, well, look, these artistic mechanisms afterwards do convey 3D information. So I, I yeah, wanted you to... Now, remember what I said when I was showing you the VP8 videos? Yeah. yeah. Anything you put into a VP8 or the equivalent modern computer uh, software, it's going to still stretch any densities into vertical space. Mm -hmm. And you'll get a... And I showed you what the kids looked like. They were completely distorted. Mm -hmm. But the shroud yields the natural relief of a human form. And that is what's unique about that image and why the VP8 is so significant. It confirms that that data is encoded in the density of the image. So that was the scientific reason that convinced me that I want to go find out about that image. You know, that, that hit me right in my own expertise. Of course, the other thing was free trip to Italy. <laughs> so I, I have to be honest about that. <laughs> No, no problem. No, um, I would take it too. I mean, geez. Absolutely. Just... <laughs> when, when I say free, by the way, it was by no means free. I had to go to the bank and borrow a thousand dollars because I didn't have a lot of loose cash and you need to have some money in your pocket when you're in Europe. Yeah. Um, and it was funny because the banker never heard of the shroud and I was trying to explain what it was to him. And he finally, he leans back and he goes, well, I don't know about any of that, but we'll loan you a thousand dollars. That was kind of funny, but that was, remember, before we went and did it, before the National Geographic uh, published it around the world, uh, Life Magazine, you know, for a professional photographer who uh, cut my teeth from the time I was a little kid, the most awaited event of the week was the arrival of Life Magazine and uh, once a month, the Geographic. Um, so to get my photographs in Life Magazine and National Geographic within one six-month period, that was pretty amazing. And people have said to me, well, wouldn't you want to see your work in those publications on a regular basis? And my answer to that is, how many times did Hillary have to climb Everest? Once. I was there first. <laughs> so I don't have to do it again. I don't have to see my work. Just seeing my work in those publications was the affirmation that I had achieved a goal I'd had since I was a little kid. So I was very grateful for this opportunity and I'm very glad that I eventually said yes. And you made your mama proud. She sure did. She, she, she saw me on TV. For a Jewish mother, that's all there is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so Daniel, were you were you gonna follow? Yeah, up? I was just gonna say, just to add to Dale's question, I'm very uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure in one of Jackson's papers in the '80s, following up on that, he actually worked with two artists, forensic artists, to try and see if he could reproduce uh, the sort of 3D effect. And it seemed like only once Jackson began sort of telling them what to do, rather than just Good. Then you started getting positive sort All right, of correlations. Let me answer that by bringing your, to your attention some work done by a forensic anthropologist, Dr. Emily Craig. People have said, well, if you look at Emily Craig's version, she did a pretty good job in getting some of that natural relief of a human form into her results. So I said, okay, let's examine Emily Craig. For the first 25 years of her career, she was a medical illustrator, okay? Which means she knows more about human anatomy than most doctors, okay? So she understood the human anatomy and she studied the shroud. She studied that property of the shroud and was able because of her artistic skills to incorporate that into her results. And I have another talk that Dale and I've discussed, uh, what do we really know for sure, where I sort of go into detail on what Emily did and why her results, although she was able to get some of that natural relief going, but she used red iron oxide and there would have been a billion visible particles of red iron oxide in her results. Not to mention the snow on. fencing. What's that? Not to mention the snow fencing with the- Well, the snow fencing, to me, that's minor. Your eyes can see red particles on a mm -hmm. microscope, no problem. The snow fencing is a little more uh, obscure. Yeah. You know. Perhaps but, at this point, at this point is where we have to sort of take our sci scientific hat on and go, okay, this detail can be reproduced, but here we have to sort of step uh, it can be way back. 
Yeah, it and, can be reproduced by somebody with artistic skills beyond yeah. anything that existed in medieval times. Exactly, uh, it's about knowledge. And um, the fact that she has all of my photographs and all the other photographs of the Shroud, he uses a, a reference. But somebody in medieval times wouldn't have had any of that. Yeah, I don't think it can be reproduced with all of its special properties because you've got to reproduce the the blood stains where you don't have the dentilation right. around the edges on the linen where it's a, a transfer of a blood clot exudate you've got to have the superficiality you've got to have the 3d there's so many um it, I mean, it's just crazy i mean that, that i think is the one thing that i can recall that i disagreed with uh with dr adler about where he said yeah you know give me enough money and i could you know, and the technology and I could reproduce. And I was like, ah, I'm not so well, sure you, about you, that. If, if you knew Al Adler like I knew Al uh -huh. Adler, that sounds like a song title. Um, <laughs> That'd be a good one. I like uh, it. Listen, Al was a unique character. He was brilliant. And, you know, like so many ultra brilliant people, God apparently wants to keep us all equal. So he says, you're going to really be a brilliant blood chemist, but we're going to take something away. He never drove a car a day in his life. Huh. Had, had to be driven everywhere. So Al was a character. Uh -huh. Al, Al gave me lots of crap about building the website. Uh, I would walk into a conference and, oh, Mr. Internet's here. Look, Mr. Internet. But eventually he allowed me to reprint one of his papers on the website, which up until then he would have to go to the, uh, the, the uh, copy store you know, to get a copy made, he'd have to have somebody drive him to the copy store to get a copy made. They have to put it in an envelope, fold it up and have somebody drive him to the post office to mail it. And once he put it on our website, he said, yeah, he, he started to relent. And eventually, hmm. eventually said, yeah, he says, you were right. The internet's a good thing. Barry's so, on to something. Yeah, but it, yeah, but it, it looked, it took a couple of years uh -huh. before he finally backed off and went, yeah, maybe that is a good idea. So uh, Al was, like I say, he was a character. <laughs> All right, cool. So I have one last question. It, it's not necessarily uh, photography related, but uh, yeah, this, this guy really wants to hear your take on it. So uh, Matt Dillahunty, I don't know if you know him. He's a famous <laughs> atheist. He, he apparently talks to Joe Nickel in person or something. <laughs> but, um, that, that's the name I didn't want to mention before. He doesn't want to debate with me anymore. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. I've heard he's, but even Hugh Ferry kind of says he's about thirty years out of date and stuff, right? But um, one thing, uh, so one thing that they're bringing up is an anatomical inaccuracy, and I've gotten your take on some of these. So one of the one that they bring up is that, well, look, it couldn't have covered a body. There should be a gap, but instead, the dorsal image head and the frontal image head are exactly back to back, and that. Ah, uh, do you want to re refute this one? Yeah, <laughs> easy to refute. I'm sorry that I can't show it to you, but I, this question has come to me so often that I have a pre-written response to this. Here's what's happening. There is a space of about six, seven inches between the two head, ventral and dorsal head images, mm -hmm. but there's a water stain that touches the top of the head and people always mistake that for the other side of the head. And it's not, otherwise the man would have been paper thin. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is look closely. You'll see where the actual head image is six or eight inches between the two head images. But there's that water stain that touches the ventral image and everybody says, oh, that's the back of the head. This guy's paper thin. Can't be well, right. You mentioned, you, given how the shroud was laid out, you've got the, the fabric and it's curving around the top of the head. And given that we know with the image making, uh, the, the, the formation of the image, it, it at the whatever energy or whatever came out of the body or I mean that's what it seems to be but the thing is it wouldn't get that top part of the head because it was just a frontal well we also don't know when it was wrapped around the head whether it was actually touching the top of the scalp or if there was any distance there you could have put it there with some distance from the top of the head we don't know like if I'm standing and if if the image is coming just straight forward, you're not going to get this top part of That's my head. True. And That's so true. to me, but, but it, the point that 
this skeptic made mm-hmm. makes me laugh because they're misinterpreting a water stain for being the back of the head when in fact the back of the head six inches beyond it. And it's such a common occurrence that I get that from people that I have an illustration. So if I'd known this was going to come up, I would have put that up somewhere to show you guys because mm-hmm. I've showed them an image of the shroud. I did an outline of where the ventral head is. I did an outline of the dorsal head and then a different color showed the water stain that people are mistaking for the other side of the head. It's just, it's just a misinterpretation of what's there. This tells me that whoever this skeptic is has not really paid a lot of attention to the shroud or studied it in depth, or he would know that. Hear that, Matt Delahunty? Please do your research. So <laughs> he's a famous And And, and listen, in, in all fairness to Matt, because I don't know you, Matt, if you send me an email asking me that question, I will show you, I will send you personally that image that I've created to show you the difference where the two heads are and the space between them. You send me an email, I'll respond. Awesome. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, Teddy, that now the moment, now back to some more intelligent based questions. So, uh, Teddy, yeah, I'll give you the floor. We have about like just to respect Barry's time, about twenty more minutes. Would you say twenty to twenty-five? That's cool. Whatever. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, Teddy, take it away with your question. One of the interesting things, uh, Barry, when you were showing that uh, that amazing shot that Mark Evans took, uh, the close-up with the the body image, where you see just that straw yellow color and mm-hmm. and the superficiality of it, and almost the translucent quality of it. I had never noticed this before until, I mean, I've seen the image, that image before and even kind of blown up, but it, for the first time, and I think that usually the Evans photographs were about 40 times in terms of. The uh, they varied, they varied from about 36 up to about 60 X, if I remember correctly, 50. Well, one of the interesting things that I noticed looking at that on my uh, laptop for the first time, um, just in that magnification is I noticed little bitty flecks or dots and I'm not sure if I and I don't think that those can be blood because that's not a blood stain area and it's probably not even the translocated blood. I'm wondering if that is some evidence of the iron from the retting process. Well, here's the thing the, the iron from the retting uh-huh. is so sparse across that cloth that if all of it were scraped together into a pile, you'd still need a microscope to right, see Right, right. So at those ma- lower magnifications, I don't think that's it. Yeah, um, because so, I, I, so. or- I would think you would need a higher magnification even to detect them. Because mm-hmm. I, because it was just, uh, you know, I noticed just here and there, now, which obviously that's not enough there are 52, if I'm not mistaken, documented occasions where the Savoy family allowed an artist to make a depiction, a copy of the shroud. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Savoys were very smart. They allowed the artist to lay their artwork onto the cloth, not only to sanctify it, but to make it a relic. And even more so, they would cut a little piece out of the corner of the shroud and sew that into the corners of the copies. I saw the one that's in Portugal in, at the museum in Porto, they hadn't taken it out for a hundred years. I was there. They took it out to show it to me, and there's a little bit of the shroud in each corner. So oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, That's well, beautiful. the Savoy's look. It was their baby. They could do whatever they right. wanted with it, and they would frequently cut pieces out of it. I know, but I didn't know that they would sometimes attach them onto some of the authentic uh, yeah. reproduction. And, and yeah. in some, and I'm not very good at Latin, but in in some of the copies that were made, the artist printed onto the copy by his hand, extractum de originale, mm. taken from the original. Right. So that, those are the ones that we know actually came in contact with the shroud. And if they were using red iron ox- oxide pigments, um, it's quite possible that a couple of flakes would have gotten onto the shroud. And there are at least 52 documented occasions that that was done documented. So you've got to be careful because and then, of course, there's the rolling and unrolling of it countless, probably a thousand times in its history over the centuries, which would cause some translocation of both the blood particulates and any of the uh, artistic well, pigments. I'm just wondering that, if, if that magnification, if it's possible 
that some of the iron just from the reading you don't think so you don't think it's possible that I, I think that anything? I think that the iron from the reading which is pure iron oxide right. not with any manganese cobalt or any of the other artist right. pigment things um I don't think there's enough of it that you because there were quite a few of them in that one microscope image I I think that there aren't that many on the shroud so I think that they may only be visible at a higher magnification hmm. Uh, uh, as Giulio Fonti frequently refers to, uh, what does he call them, uh, submicron particles. Mm -hmm. So those would not be visible at 30 or 40 or 50 X. Unless they're aggregates, because sometimes the iron oxide can, well, I, you know, I mean, it's just a yeah, hypothesis. Yeah, now we're just uh, speculating. So mm -hmm. you got to be careful. There's so much speculation already in the world of the shroud that it drives me absolutely crazy. Um, and all these theories, and I, again, I don't want to mention anybody's names, but a lot of people take the minutest speck of data and extrapolate it into something so far beyond what it can support that it's embarrassing. And I have said this to a number of different Shroud scholars, doing no science at all is better than doing bad science, because mm -hmm. that gives the skeptics all the ammunition they need to attack. But the thing that we do know, I mean, but we know even from other linen samples that, that it is to be expected that you're going to have iron on the cloth. So we know that it's on there. Yep. So then the, the question is just, is that an example of it? But we know from the Beer Lambert law that you're not getting enough iron from the readings to for that to account for the I image. Think I think they got the most iron readings in the blood samples. Right, right, right. It was much higher than what was than in anywhere the else, uniformly right. spread throughout the... Yeah, uh, and literally, the literally evenly spread. And that's why we think it's from the retting process. Right. Because any iron that would be in the water when they ret the, you know, put the plants in and soak them, uh, it's going to get into the plant. And they've, and they've so seen that, that another linen too. So yeah. it's... So I, I don't know, it, it, it was just, it, you know, I, yeah, I, I don't that. know that those images can answer that question. Mm -hmm. And, and again, another reason where it would be great to have access for another in-depth study using 21st century technology, something that I think most Shroud scholars today would 100% agree with. And look, even the folks in Turin would like to see more um, testing but they don't have a say in the matter, not at all. Uh, that's up to the owner of the shroud, in this case, Pope Francis. And uh, my sources have said that he's not gonna permit any scientific testing. And look, let's face it, uh, in the recent history of the shroud, we have the radiocarbon dating, it's kind of a fiasco. Then we have the restoration, which caused an explosion in the, Shroud that was done behind everybody's back and without the best of that, no science involved, no scientists involved. And they even said in their they press release they bungled that on their own. They said that in their press release that uh, this was this was about preservation, not science. How can you have one without the other? I don't know. So anyway, uh, because of those two fiascos that got a lot of bad press, uh, I think Pope Francis wisely said, "I'm not going to touch this." <laughs> I'm leaving this alone. You know, it's like the damage has been done. Now you need to let the people, the advocates, go well, in there, do their testing, and well, to let me be bold and make a statement from my perspective. Mm -hmm. I believe it serves the church's purpose best to remain a mystery. See, right. I, I'm really big on. That's because you don't deal with Roman Turin like I have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true, yeah. All right, uh, Teddy, let me ask, do you have, um, do you have another question uh, related to the photography as well? And Daniel as well, feel free after Barry gives his answer, if you want to follow up, just as Teddy did during your time, feel free to come in anytime with a follow-up. But yeah, Teddy, um, do you have another? Well, it, it, well, the photography, Barry, you know, it, it's just, just magnificent. And that you're cataloging it but between the professionalism and the technical abilities but you know with, with photography I don't have to tell you but with photography there's an art to it it's not 
snapping a camera it's lighting it's yeah i mean the right that, angle that, and that's, that's why i spent three and a half years at brooks institute of photography learning the technology before i ever went out to apply it and right. frankly they taught me the underlying science and the basics of photography but the rest of it i had to learn in the field by doing it I mean, it's like driving a car. You can't learn to drive a car or, or swimming. You can't learn to swim out of a book. Yeah. You have to jump in the water. You Practicing law, it's the same thing. You know, you, you're a baby lawyer and you, you go into court the first time and, and you're, you don't know where to stand. <laughs> it's, 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 we say baptism by fire, uh, but you know, that's sometimes the best way to learn. Well, I do my best to stay out of courtrooms. <laughs> Okay. Any, anything else? Uh, to, uh, well, sure. so I'm gonna be just a little bit more fiery. Uh, I, I, in, and, you know, I know you're I'm gonna disagree, <laughs> Barry, but I just wanted to say this with Ken's being so forthright about his convictions. Yeah. I know the scientists are like, oh, you're bungling things up because, oh, now it looks like there's bias. But there's, you know, as I frequently say, there is something so much bigger than science. Teddy, and that is yeah, true. But, but that's not what a scientific team is designed for. Those are issues that are theological. They're beyond what we were involved with. And Ken made a horrible mistake by doing what he did. And if you ask him, he'll tell you that. Maybe I'll disagree with Ken on that. I, no, I, he's the um, one who did it. You're a lawyer. It's your job to disagree. I understand that. <laughs> but in this particular case, there's nothing to disagree about. He was representing a scientific research team. There was no place for him to say what he said. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you're looking at it much more from a Catholic point of view. Well, I'm not Catholic. I'm Well, or, but, from yeah. a religious point of view. Fine, but, you're entitled to do that. But what was done 45, 45 years ago impacted the uh, perception of what we did dramatically. But now there's an issue as to, so let's just assume we know 100% certainty that the shroud is authentic. Yeah. Okay, so if somebody is armed, so if somebody is armed with that knowledge, or or, or let's just say if somebody is armed with the knowledge of a hundred percent certainty of God's existence, if you're not over the top exuberant about it, there's a little you got to wonder about the person. Yeah, but that, sorry, Teddy, that doesn't fly. That does not. Fly. This is not a courtroom we're talking about. This is the public perception of a scientific research team. And you can't get up on national television and express your personal faith as a representative of the scientific team. That was the mistake. That was what Ken apologized for. That's what he agrees was an error. And that's done and part of the history of the SERP team. I, done. I have uh, one uh, quick question that you might be able to, to answer based on the photography as well. Um, so, so you mentioned it during your presentation that, um, look, we can rule out from the UV fluorescence uh, scorching, um, yeah. you know, scorches fluoresce red and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, some skeptics have differentiated between a low temperature scorch or a high temperature scorch. Do you think like the photographic evidence or the spectral evidence can rule out all types of scorches? Does it matter? Or? Well, it ru rules it out enough uh, that the properties of the image nowhere on that image was there any indication of any kind of high temperature event. A low temperature event wouldn't scorch the linen. So, mm. I mean, you have to reach a threshold of temperature that will cause a discoloration of the lim linen. Mm. And when you reach that, if you look at the most faint scorches on the shroud, they're about the same as the image itself. So if the shroud were a scorch, we'd have seen some fluorescence there especially in some of the darker areas of the uh, shroud's image where there's a higher concentration of those yellow fibers. We, we would have seen some evidence in the UV fluorescence. So I, I think that the skeptics, you know, they're grasping for straws. There's so much data pointing to them being wrong. 
Uh, they've got to grasp it, you know, uh, when uh, a certain well-known shroud skeptic spoke at the uh, uh, Ancaster mm -hmm. conference in Canada, I predicted exactly what he was going to say. He was going to tell us about Walter McCrone. And he was going to mention the Darcy memorandum. And oh. when he got when he got to the Sturp team, he was going to wave his hand and dismiss all the science as the rantings of believers. And I'm quoting right out of his book. So when he did that, I predicted he would do that at the Ancaster conference. And I'm sitting in a room, about 120 of us in a big auditorium-like room. And Joe Nickel, I'm sorry, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it. Joe. But everybody knew who I was talking about anyway. Um, he got up and he he did exactly Walter McCrone, Darcy Memorandum, and the Sturt team. And he started to, oh, they're just a bunch of religious. And I stood up and I said, that's not true. In the loudest voice I could muster, and it trembled the walls. And from that moment forward, Joe Nickel, since I've already told you who it was, every 10 seconds kept looking over to me. I think I might have intimidated him a little bit. But it's absolutely false that this was a bunch of religious guys. And Joe Nickel doesn't know he wasn't there. He doesn't know any of these people. It's when people start criticizing STERP team members, especially those who are dead. And, and look, criticize their conclusions, criticize their methodology. That's science. That's fine. But criticize them personally, attack them personally ad hominem with... Uh, uh, you know, without any uh, forewarning, and especially when they're dead and can't even defend themselves, I, I won't tolerate that. Gotcha. Perfect. Okay. Um, I think what I'll do at this point, since I just asked one last follow-up question, um, I'll give each of my co-hosts one last, like, quick question kind of thing, and let Barry answer before we close out. But uh, Teddy, I'll start with you. Um, do you, is there any other question that we didn't cover that you really want to get Barry's take on? Uh, well, I, you were sort of touching upon it a little bit in terms of the image and with the whole uh, low temperature possibility with the holy fire and and, and with, with okay. Ray Rogers. I don't know anything about the holy fire. Okay. That, that's... It would that's, just be a low temperature heat uh, um, I, I don't know anything about that and so i don't know if there's any relevance at all okay all right cool uh yeah daniel uh go for it if you have a last question or yeah i, I hope this is short barry um uh, but i know like one of the challenges i have when i was first trying to get into like the actual science behind the shroud and stuff like that as a lay person doesn't have a big scientific background is that it's very difficult to go through the literature and try and sort of get an assessment of where the dialectic is at um i'm curious if you had any recommendations for like uh, where people should start off when it comes to reading. Yeah, and, and again, I think I kind of intimated this earlier in my presentation or somewhere. Um, if you're going to study the shroud, you have to start with data taken directly from the cloth, primary sources. Those are all readily available on shroud.com, and uh, Dale's going to put some links there so it help, help people find them. Um, even if the papers are way above your head technical, technologically, because some of them are way above, I'm not a physicist or a chemist myself. So if, if you have trouble with all the details in the middle, go to the, read the abstract, read the conclusions. And that way, at least you get a sense of what they're talking about, even if the details are beyond your skill set. Um, but I always tell everybody that if you're going to start to study the shroud, and I've even said this to Teddy more than once, Start with the primary sources based on direct physical examination of the cloth. And that way, some of the questions that you ask, Teddy, you notice I keep sending you old stuff back because if you'd read those already, you wouldn't have asked that question. I've read them, I've read them, but sometimes I, you know, there are additional questions that- I understand uh, and I've done my best to answer as many of your questions. You are a fantastic source of information. But the answer to Daniel is start with the primary sources for better, for worse, they don't cover everything and they aren't perfect, but they are based on direct physical examination of that cloth. Anything beyond that involves what? Basing it on our data or speculating beyond it. But, well, one other thing too, there are certain things where there are uh, scientific experiments that are connected with certain principles concerning the shroud that are 
uh, that are very relevant. And so yeah, it's but, not. But Ted, Teddy, you got you read those after you've read the permit. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, of course. I you know you can't and, put the and, cart before the horse. And, but answering Daniel's question, that I believe that. Anyone who wants to study the shroud should begin with those primary sources. It's the only data we have that's taken directly from the cloth. Everything that came after that, yeah, there are some that didn't require access to data from the shroud directly to speculate or to propose theories or hypotheses in, in other directions. But the primary sources are where one should begin. And I think any credible scientist will tell you that you start with the primary sources and then see where that leads. Uh, Ray Rogers and Al Adler both used to have an expression. In those days, I got tired of hearing it, but they were right. Follow the data, follow the data, follow the data. Adler said it to me a hundred times, Rogers a thousand times. And he said, you don't start with any conclusions. You start with nothing. And you collect the data, then you follow the data, and where it leads you is where you go. That's science. Awesome. All right. Cool. Well, I think I think that covers it. Uh, I hope uh, Barry you, uh, and the, my two co-hosts, you guys had a good time on your time on your end. Yep. Absolutely. Sure. Awesome. Yeah, it was a great presentation. And guess what? For the fans, we're not done with Barry. He's going to be coming back to do part two. He kind of hinted at. Um, do you want to maybe give a, I don't know, you don't want to spill the beans or whatever. No, no, I can, I can yeah. give you, I'll, get, I'll tell you what the next one is. It's, uh, it's called, so what do we know for sure? <laughs> <laughs> and basically, uh, it was written as part of the course I teach at the Pontifical uh, University in Rome. So that's why I wasn't ready to give it today and it would have been too long anyway. But it's so filled with academic requirement stuff for the course, which is in the master's program, that it needs to be toned down a little bit and simplified to be able to present it to a lay audience. But it's basically, I've taken each of the proposed theories of image formation, painting, scorching, rubbing, Emily Craig, uh, Nicholas Allen's photographic theory, and I piece by piece by piece do a side by side comparison and show you why they're wrong. That would be amazing. That's what we know for sure that it's none of those things, but we still don't have an answer to what it actually is. Awesome. So that's what you can look forward to. Uh, hopefully, I don't know, in the next couple of weeks, I don't know what your schedule is. Yeah, I'll make that a month or two because I'm still struggling to get an update done by the end of this month. So. Oh, that's right. Gotcha. <laughs> no problem. Very busy. So Awesome. Yeah. With that said, um, I think I will close up the show. I'll say thank you so much for, for listening. I, I really hope that you got something out of it. Uh, Barry put a lot of work into the presentation and thanks to, to him and thanks to my two co-hosts for coming up with excellent questions and yeah, have a, have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thanks Barry. Great seeing y'all. <laughs>